Buongiorno! Hello! <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back to Mother Medieval, the podcast. That's <laughs> I can't do it. I that can't do it. That was my Vito Corleone impersonation, everyone. <laughs> I feel like I have no excuse because I do speak Italian, but I still can't like pretend to have an Italian accent when I speak English. Yeah, I find it really hard. So you're a native Italian speaker, but you'd have to pretend that you are a non-native Italian speaker pretending to be an Italian speaker speaking English because Marlon Brando didn't speak Italian. So you'd have to have those nuances. Yeah, I know for sure. <laughs> I wish I could though, because I find it really funny, you know, when you have like you've those like thick Italian accents when you speak English. It's just like very iconic and like very still very present thing with Italian English speakers who are Italian. Yes, uh, definitely. And there's also, of course, the stereotypes, particularly of like New York and that kind of being there. And then it kind of merges into that Brooklyn, Bronx, weird American Italian mixture. Anyways, woo! <laughs> welcome back to Modern Medieval, a podcast. I'm Megan. And I'm Ello. And today we're going to be <laughs> speaking about Sicily. Yes, because Ello is currently in Sicily. But before we kind of get into our Sicilian vibes, we wanted to just <laughs> briefly talk about a few things that we have seen across the news that have kind of tickled the modern medieval funny bone. The funny bone. I love yeah. that. <laughs> or hubris. I don't know. That sounds quite, you know, like Latin and medieval. So the first one is about the wine windows. I don't know if anybody has seen those, you know, come out. I was forwarded a New York Post, so back to New York, link um, that says medieval wine windows are reopening, reviving Italian plague tradition. So this is linked to our Italian theme today. But these windows known as, and correct me if I'm wrong in pronouncing this, Ello, Babe wine windows? B-A-B-A-E? Babe, yeah. Babe, okay. <laughs> hey, Babe. Hey, <laughs> B-A-B-A-E? Yeah. Bye-bye. Maybe. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Okay. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Um, <laughs> sorry. But these are actually early modern. So in 1559, uh, Cosimo de' Medici decreed that noble families could sell the wine from their vineyards directly out of their palaces. And this was during a time of plague. But basically, these are tiny little windows that are like the size of a book or so. Anything you could kind of push a, a bottle of wine or a glass of wine through. And what you would do is you would go and go to the window and knock on it. And then no. the person inside would, you know, take your order and then fill your bottle and hand it to you. And then you would drink your bottle. And then with the empty bottle, you would put your payment inside and then toss it back through the, or push it back through the window. If it makes you feel like, I know this sounds like very odd to us, right? But like, for example, in Sicily, up until like the 70s or 80s, Mm -hmm. um, you'd have people like street vendors. And like the way that would work is that you would bring your, like throw your bucket down your balcony Mm -hmm. and they would fill up the stuff and bring it back up. And you could just like fill up with whatever it was like fruit vegetables or like ganita or ice cream and then they would like bring it back up so it's interesting how like that kind of thing never really stopped yeah well like I'm also thinking so my friend she lived in Arezzo Italy for a while Mm -hmm. she did a commedia dell'arte at a school there she would talk about how she you know she would walk to town because they were about 20 or 30 minutes outside the town like where the villa was where the school was and how you would just go to like a local person that sold wine and they would just fill up like giant jugs of wine for you. And I know that's American. That's such a novelty. I guess yeah. you can do it with beer, but like with wine. And I feel like this is just kind of in that where it's such a part of the culture. But I just love the idea of like going up to a little door and knocking, you know, and a hand yeah. just emerges. And this makes me think of, I can't recall what agent it is, but in Get Smart, the one that's like in walls and trees and it would just be its face. So, yeah, yeah. I think Bill Murray plays it, the one with Steve Carell, or like the hand in the Munsters. I don't know. It's just like it's very comedic to me, but also very practical. And they're coming back now because of coronavirus. So that's why they were in yeah. the news. There's a there's a place in Milan that does this it's known as the smallest bar in the world, I think. It's like tiny. Mm-hmm. And what they do is like the kind of like the same concept. You knock on the on the little window and it's mm-hmm. all wooden. They open up and you put your order. You don't see the face of the person and then like 
out comes a drink. Yeah, I love that. It's just so novel. Like it's such a fun yeah. experience, I feel. So yeah, I'm all for little like wine windows everywhere. You know? it's, <laughs> I mean, it would yeah. be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be so great. Um, so, and then second in our kind of medieval pop culture fun thing. So medievalists.net just came out with like a little fun feature quiz of which religious order would you belong to if you lived in the medieval times? So naturally, Ello and I took this because <laughs> why not? You know, why not? And we both got the Dominican. So this is also Order of the Preachers. And it was founded by St. Dominic in the early 13th century. So the reason why we're talking about this is because today, the day we're recording, which is August 8th, just found out that today is the Saint's Day of St. Dominic. So, <laughs> oh, the coincidence. Kind of, you know, yeah, coincidence. I kind of feel like, well, we'll have the link for you guys to take the test if you want to as well. But I kind of feel like, I don't know about you, but the questions that they asked were kind of like, yeah, either or, or like there were quite extreme differences between the activities that you could choose between or like what kind of things you like to do, what kind of things you like to read or, you know, that kind of thing. And I was just like, but, but what if you like one and the other? Yeah, no, I definitely uh, feel the same. Like one of the questions is what object would you choose? And it's like veil, book, rose, sword, right. and like goblet. Right, and like why would you choose a goblet? Yeah, and I, I'm just kind of like, you know, like, I want the sword, but if I'm thinking practically, of course I want the book, book but, like, the sword will protect me. So, then, you know, sword, of course, is going to be, like, the Crusaders, like, the Templars. But it's really fun, so, yeah, we'll include the link to that. And also, if you're like, the Dominicans sound kind of familiar, just one little, like, final tidbit. Perhaps the most famous and greatest theologian and philosopher uh, associated with religion in history, St. Thomas Aquinas. I was going to say that, but I was yeah. fearing of falling on under- on my face you know <laughs> no, it's fine. but he was a Dominican so yeah. yeah just fun so like we're we're in the same club as St. Thomas not to like, your own horns but <laughs> it's kind of triggering for me because like a lot of my dissertation reading stuff is around that and I'm just be like oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah those are kind of our just like fun fact whatnot of course there's lots of other things going on in the news that we could link to medieval but a lot of it's very tragic and heavy and we just don't want to we want this to be a kind of a safe fun space random fun facts yes yeah and a place to just kind of think about the medieval in a more playful light rather than kind of constantly being bombarded by the harsh reality that we're frequently doused in so anyways Sicily. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I've never been to Sicily. I've my experience of Italy, aside from you know Italian restaurants, whatever that means, <laughs> as um, I've been to Florence and I've been to Rome. Both of those just for a few days. So yeah. I haven't done the South. Anything I know about Sicily is either again restaurants or like The Godfather. That's why we chose our <laughs> Okay, so yeah, you think of like the mafia, which is a very, I mean, I guess there's a truth to that. That's also very stereotypical, you know? Yeah, it's quite a complicated reality. I mean, I feel like also, I feel like most people would associate Italy with like, you know, the more continental part and like looking yeah. at Milan, Venice, Rome, maybe Naples, if they've gone that south. Yeah, I was going to go, if they think south, I think it's Naples because pizza, it's like the birthplace yeah. of pizza, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, Sicily, we always kind of just thought of it and learned about it in geography. So Italy is the boot, and then Sicily is the ball that's being kicked. Yeah, and it's also so interesting because, like, it's really close to Africa. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe not when you're on a boat, but, like, geographically, it's kind of surreal that it's part of Europe in a way. Yeah, I guess, and this is definitely going to go within what we talk about later, it's in a very like unique kind of setting that has allowed for a very rich tapestry of history. So I'm excited to talk about this. And Me too. I don't know much. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ella, you are currently in Sicily, correct? Yeah. So I am um, near Palermo, but I'm by the s- so Palermo's by the sea, but I'm kind of like further east from it. And so I'm like 90 kilometers away from Palermo. And so I'm in the countryside, which is really lovely. It's really pretty. That makes me think of The Godfather even more. <laughs> <laughs> when Michael goes to Sicily, he's like, they're in the country. They don't go to the beach at all. So has it been really warm? I don't know the climate because you're Mediterranean. So. so actually, conversely, it's nice. And like sometimes it's warm and obviously kind of humid. Mm-hmm. But because Sicily has like such 
kind of it's kind of like the desert right we're like during the day it's really hot and then it kind of starts cooling down and so it's been the first few days so we came by boat and we drove down so that was kind of interesting as well because we went from I, I live in Ancona which is kind of like in, on the Adriatic coast and we went to Salerno which is near Naples and then we took the boat mm-hmm. and you had like the shift in temperature um and then it started raining and so it's nice and cool and like not too bad I think in London it's much worse isn't it yeah London is the complete converse right now it's been just very much a roller coaster ride where some days are very nice and sunny and tolerable and then we'll have a blast of like three or four days where it's sweltering and you just can't escape it hello you aren't just like visiting Sicily on a whim like you are I, I'm Italian American but um I was born in Palermo and my on both of my parents side their parents were born here in Sicily so both my grandparents mm-hmm. grandfather sorry were born in Sicily and then my mom's mom is American so I have kind of like a close relationship to Sicily even though I've never really lived here. Right. And then you have, for our audience, they're going to be like, wait, but she has a British accent. So I then came to, <laughs> <laughs> I then came to uh, the UK for you to do my undergraduate degree. And I, I used to have a thick American accent. And then the longer you're in the UK, the more that changes. So be careful, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed some slight changes. My A's have gotten softer, but that's about it thus far. And, you know, of course, saying certain words like flat I think apartment it, yeah and I also think it's inflection and you don't even realize that you're doing it and then in a couple of years time you'll be like oh my god <laughs> that was it I'm okay with that I feel like I have a very California inflection which is not always the most um, appealing at least to me maybe it's because I'm from it but hello you are really intimately related to Sicily I mean you're from there you're born there it's your homeland essentially right. and so you have a very uh, special relationship to Mm -hmm. this place and you were able we've touched upon this in previous episodes but you were able for one of our medieval essays to write about Sicily uh, specifically the uh, Capella Palatina so I don't know if you want to like talk about that a little bit because it's such a great case example of Sicily's unique history right for broader context during my undergraduate I studied Italian literature and history and um, I did also that with French literature and stuff and um, one thing that always interested me was the fact that in Italy, we have lots of dialects. So mm-hmm. every region has a different dialect. And before Italy, because Italy is kind of a, a new country, you know, in quotes, because right. it's not really that old. And so before that, people would like you'd have different dialects in different regions. And that was the primary language, whereas normal, like standardized Italian came later on. And so mm-hmm. Sicily has a very thick, very specific and original dialect and within that dialect you have words from Arabic words you have different like kind of like almost nearly a different grammar uh there is no future so mm-hmm. everything is in the past and so that kind of already indicates that this region is kind of different in like it's its own place and so when we were thinking about writing essays mm-hmm. I thought about how actually Sicily has had many many cultures and many many different periods because of which it's been unique and yeah. so I I thought of like, you know, what is an emblematic building or Mm -hmm. what is an emblematic cultural building? And so it also happened that in December I'd come to Sicily and I went to see the Cappella Palatina, which is in the middle of Palermo. For all of you who've gone to Palermo, you'll know that it's the capital of the region and it has been since the early 12th century. Um, obviously these things have been contested in time but there is a, a very big important building which is the pal- the Norman palace and that kind of hints to the here and so I looked at the Cappella Palatina which is within in the Norman palace and which was the way in, like the you know kind of like the castle in mm-hmm. the, 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 the um, where all of the powers were relying on that building and so it was interesting because it has different influences within that chapel and it was a period it was built like over time but in the inside was properly built in the 12th in no in the 14th century uh during the reign of Roger the second it was a time of peace where both with the Greeks the Byzantines Catholics and I think that's it I may be wrong maybe the Latins as well all lived within the island and there weren't any conflicts. And so it takes, you know, some bits from uh, Byzantine mosaics, 
-hmm. And then it has some imagery, some Catholic imagery. It has the mukarnas, which are like typical Arabic architectural features. Mm -hmm. And it kind of is very interesting. And I think it's very unique and representative of Sicily. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it. Quick little fact check that I did while you were talking. You were right the first time before you correct yourself on Roger the second, he is 12th century. 12th century. Whoops. Yeah, not 14th. <laughs> it's okay. For some reason, you really want the 14th century to be like <laughs> Sicily. Yeah, sorry. That's sorry. okay. The Capella Palatina, if you were to Google it, you will see, as Ella was saying, lots of Greek iconography because Greece is, first of all, just so close to Italy. And then you have the crossover of antiquities and everything. We have the Arabic which is from the Arab period, which is about 200 years. So the dates are kind of, because it's regional, it can kind of be contested, yeah. but 827 to 1091, you know, give or, give or take. And then we have the Norman era, which Ella is talking about. So that's Roger, which is really, that's seen as the most peaceful, perhaps, time. Like peaceful time. But yeah. if we do look at the Arab period, that's actually very peaceful as well. I mean, the Arabs let Eastern Orthodox Christians practice uh, yeah. their freedom of religion, they had just had to pay a specific tax. But I didn't know this until I read about it. Um, but Muslims have to pay an obligatory alms tax known as the jizya. So they have to pay a tax as well. Yeah. But the Orthodox Christians also had um, the limitation of they weren't allowed to actively participate in public affairs. But oh. nonetheless, they were still able to openly practice their religion. So, yeah, and, it, and I think it's also within the history of like the, the chapel itself, mm -hmm. um, some historians and arch archeologists disagree on the use of the chapel, whether it was an actual place of worship or whether it was something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of interesting as well that like that could, they saw it as a political move to like show that everyone was actually united even if they were different. And so that's not what I expected at all when thinking of like the medieval, right? Like that's not the kind of medieval that I'd ever imagined to exist. Right. Yeah. It's always kind of feels like tense and fraught with anxieties and animosities. And especially when we consider a European versus, you know, a Middle Eastern Arab medieval, because we instantly, I think, go to the Crusades. First of all, that's, we will touch upon the Crusades in later episodes because it's really fascinating it's <laughs> and it's also yeah centuries long but it's fascinating because what we're taught about the crusades and what was actually occurring are really different <laughs> there's definitely the colonialist perspective that we're taught that's not all the truth and just one more quick thing about the Arab period in Sicily which I think is very interesting is so agricultural products such as oranges lemons pistachio and sugarcane were brought to Sicily during this period which yeah especially oranges, lemons, and pistachio, those just seem so quintessentially Italian at this yeah. point. Like and Sicilian so lemon ice cream or sorbet yeah. or gelato. Yeah. So like um, one of the main things that you have here is uh, granita, which is essentially like a different type of sorbet. Mm -hmm. And it's existed since, you know, well, I'd say beginning of time, but it's not actually beginning of time, but it's very quintessentially um, Sicilian. And you'll have that in the morning mm -hmm. as your breakfast. Ooh. And so it's really interesting because all of the cuisine and all of the culture, it's really, is kind of fascinating to see how these things are all linked. So for example, in Sicily, you'll have couscous. Oh, a traditional yeah. dish is a uh, fish couscous, which isn't something you'd expect to eat in Italy, right? Right. Yeah, that doesn't seem like, it feels like it's a mashup of two because yeah. the fish, the ocean, the sea, and then again, I guess I think a bit north of Sicily, but like Naples and everything, I, I think of that being very fish oriented. That could be very wrong. That's just a... I mean, all of the areas where there's know. sea, people will eat fish. fish. So just, just a general, but like, yeah, it's true. It's not something <laughs> you'd really associate. And then other things like arancini, for example, probably something that, but you know, like they're made out of rice, right? In the middle, mm -hmm. you have like something. And the rice isn't something that you'd have really a lot of in Italy. So mm. I w don't know where that comes from, but I kind of feel like there's probably an Arabic influence in that. Right. Or some sort of non-domestic Italian, something that came from outside it then became, I guess, quote yeah. unquote, domesticized and appropriated, basically. But back to the Capella Palatina. So we also have... Uh, going at uh, something I think that's quite interesting that you were talking about. So when this was built, 
is also during the reign of the like, Kingdom of Sicily. So the Norman Sicily is about 160 years historically. Yeah. I mean, as a period. Again, these are just kind of labels to help kind of organize history. That doesn't mean that things really radically bad. change. But so Norman Sicily is understood as 1038 to 1198. Yeah. And is a continuation of the peaceful time of the Muslim rule, but it becomes less tense, but actually like lots of Muslim traditions were adopted by the Normans yep. that came, which yep. I, you wouldn't think of, especially today. Yeah. And it's actually really interesting as well, because um, one thing to be noted and something that we'll go into further detail, perhaps in other de- in other episodes, but the kingdom, so Sicily was known at some point as the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Mm-hmm. And I think the second Sicily was actually in Puglia. Okay. And so it's interesting because you have like Byzantine and like kind of a s- similar influences, if that makes sense. It's not actually too far away from one another. And for our audience, just to kind of clarify again, Byzantine, because we talked about this where in my brain, even though I'm still learning, it seems so radically different. But basically what Byzantine medieval or late antiquity medieval is, is Holy Roman Empire, that history and influence. So it doesn't mean that it's radically different than, say, other types of the medieval that we think of. It's just more geographically influenced. It's going to be a little bit further east and south, more towards the Middle East, towards Turkey and all of that. But the crossover, especially somewhere like Sicily, where you have the uh, Capella Palatina and the Byzantine influence, if you look at the images, is astounding. And yeah. I don't know about you, Elo, but when I think of the Byzantine, I instantly go to icons. Yeah. Um, usually the very uh, like large eyes, gold and tile, like yeah. gold gilding, something just everywhere, like prolific, yeah. shining, shimmering, glowing yeah. gold. So it's actually quite interesting. So for, I hope I'm getting you like a next trip um, <laughs> in the making, but um, when you go into the Norman palace, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of impressive and everything, but you don't expect when you're going into the Capella Palatina to actually see what you're going to see because it's, kind of like inconsequential surroundings I mean still obviously really beautiful but mm-hmm. then once you go in it's just like pure gold it's kind of like too much to handle almost yes from the the photos I've seen it looks stunning but it's very overwhelming I feel yeah. like you would look at one wall or even a section of a wall and feel drained because it's just so everything is covered everything <laughs> the arches under the arches the windows everything is gilded there are so many different illustrations of different saints moments in religion and then you also have the mukernas as you were talking about and nick also talked about those in his episode so there are these like designs on the ceilings and everything that are like kind of rose shaped if i remember correctly it's been a while since the essay but i think they were meant to be representative of the divine because of like kind of like the complex and you can find them in uh mosques right but yeah like shape wise they're kind of like roses and a star and then yeah echoing yeah. the divine yeah um, and actually I think, yeah i think they're meant to be stars i may be wrong but they're oh, like, yeah, like stars. The bell. when i was writing the essay it was really like kind of surreal because i'd been to this building right and then mm-hmm. it was so hard to remember anything that like when i was looking at like specific images that i'd find online i'd be like completely taken aback and looking online is overwhelming so I can't even imagine entering into that space and being surrounded by that and the candles I don't know if there's incense present at all but just that sensory experience and the spatial encounter I feel just has to be truly astounding so Mukarnas are influenced by the Fatimid art style they're in so many different Islamic styles which is great so that's like a very visual influence in Capella Palatina of the Islamic style. Again, we've talked about the mosaics being very Byzantine, very influenced by that. And then we have the Catholic iconography as well. And then I believe there's also um, Hebrew in the building as well, which you wouldn't necessarily think of, especially because during this time in history, I mean, the Jews were going through a rough, one of many (laughs) rough times, but that that is present there is really a testament, I think, to this homogenous, peaceful, or accepting, if not peaceful, time in Sicily. Yeah, and it's really interesting, right? Because as you were saying earlier, I mean, we associate Sicily with the mafia. 
Mm-hmm. And we associate Sicily with corruption. But historically, that's not always been the case. This also makes me think of when we were talking about the poetic epics a few episodes ago mm-hmm. and yeah. how you through time, interpret them a certain way because you are bound in a certain moment of history. So you're going to have certain perspectives and how we look at them differently now than when they were written or when they were analyzed. And I think that even the kind of like nostalgic or reimagining of history is also really related to that. Uh, So yeah, now it's like, oh, well, Sicily is just the mafia, but the mafia is only, I mean, I don't think the mafia in regard to medievals that old don't really know the history of the mafia but maybe a couple centuries I don't know so the mafia I think there'd been like so actually it's kind of interesting there's a bit of um, impact from the from America so the mafia as we know it kind of was formed in 1940 um before then there'd been like small town criminal Mm -hmm. activity but then during world war ii um when America was trying to find a way to come and liberate um Italy and Europe, they got affiliated with American Sicilian, American Sicilian criminals who were in the the US and they gave them leeways or like found routes for them to go through. And then essentially one of the things that they did was they freed a lot of people from Mm -hmm. these prisons and they, they were criminals. And so then that kind of started as well, but maybe like, as we know it, as we know it in 1945, but probably as early as the 20th century. Yeah, so I, I, I googled it because I wanted to, to know because it kind of appears and you just take it for granted. I can't find a date, but apparently for centuries, the roots of what we, of the mafia comes from small residents that formed groups regarding the invasions. So Romans, Arabs, French, Spanish. So potentially back to the medieval, just to protect towns and lifestyle and culture. Not so much as like an anti, you know, xenophobic, but more just to be a form of protection that later became known as clans or families Mm. that developed their own system for justice and retribution. And then by the 19th century, small private armies known as mafia took advantage of the frequently violent, chaotic conditions in Sicily. So this is 19th century and extorted protection money from landowners. And then from that, the immigration linked to the going to the Americas. So 19th century, where going to probably be like 1850s, 1880s, established in America, and then you have the connection. And then as you were saying, Ello, the mafia that we, when we talk about the mafia now, early, Mm. mid 20th century. So a little history of the mafia, everybody, in case you uh, (laughs) ever wondered. Ever wondered. But that's just one element of Sicily. So the Capella Palatina is really unique. But Ello, is it the only kind of, is it a unique example or are there other buildings influences that you have encountered in Sicily I think generally like when you so to this day um it's Sicilian ceramics are kind of a a, a big thing that you can buy and they're extremely beautiful Mm -hmm. um so I think that actually just walking around you see these influences and you see you know Sicilian dialect is one of the most intact and most spoken to this day Mm -hmm. Um, compared to some of the other regional dialects in in Italy that have kind of been forgotten and regular Italian has kind of taken place. Yeah. And so I think in a lot of the, some of the churches you can find this as well, but like in general things like the kind of tiles that you'll find around or like the the plates or the cups, that's something that you'll probably encounter. Yeah, this idea of like languages... And the politics of language is just really interesting. And Sicilian Italian is like very unique. Like you can tell it when you hear it, right? Oh, yeah. Like but I mean, so even Italians don't really know. It's kind of like with Neapolitan, right? Like those are two big dialects that people know of. And they're, mm-hmm. la- they're languages to their own, in their own right, really. Mm-hmm. And so you have to have grown up with it. A vocabulary changes, inflection changes, grammar changes. And, you know, one of the really interesting words that, you know, if you speak a bit of Arabic, you will have heard is the use of miskeen, which in Arabic, I think, means poor person or poor soul or, you know, bless that guy, kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, and that will be used in Italian. Um, interestingly, though, because all of our uh, words are basically gendered, so mm-hmm. you'd say, oh, meschino, to mean like, oh, poor guy, and meschina, to mean like, oh, poor girl. I love that. I love like language and just how it changes and influences. And another fun fact about the Arab period in Sicily related to language. 
So the language spoken in Sicily under the Arab rule was Siculo Arabic. Yeah. And so this Arabic influence is still, as you're saying, present in Sicilian words, in Italian, yeah. Italian Sicilian words. But this language, Siculo Arabic, has is extinct in Sicily and the rest of Italy. It has developed into what is now the Maltese language on the islands of Malta. So a variation of that is still alive, but its home origin has disappeared. So that's, I wonder if you'd be able to understand any of that language if you went because of the origin roots. Like I'd be yeah. curious to see if there was anything that you could. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, if you, I understand some, mm -hmm. um, but usually it's because people, they know that you may not speak it. So like they, some words might slip out, but like they'll keep the grammar and the structure. Mm. Um, but I think I actually, I'm not. I, I wouldn't be able to. I, I hope okay. that I never encounter. Old people still speak really like tight dialect and that's really hard to understand. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's just so like crazy. Because like having studied Polish language and that's a Slavic root. So Czech, Polish and Russian, they're related, but they have false friends. But like yeah. I've known people who are native Polish speakers and can kind of pick out a little bit of the Russian and kind of get yeah. gist. But yeah. I mean, we're talking about millennia here so of course evolution yeah. is going to be different um I love it so to you um pivot a little bit something I really want to talk about in regard to Sicily hello that I personally find very interesting that I love is the flag of Sicily yeah. which is so captivating for so for those of you who don't know what the Sicilian flag looks like first of all look it up it's great um <laughs> And so first of all, it was adopted in 1282. So we're talking about thir late 13th century. So it's medieval. So it definitely fits in our wheelhouse. Mm. And uh, yeah, and it's identified by what is known as triskels, maybe because it's Greek triskeles um, yeah. in the middle with a Medusa head on top of the triskel. And then you have the uh, bands or stripes in the back, which are red, gold, red, correct? Or the good. Yeah. Kind of like a dandelion yellowy color. Yeah. Um, so for those of our audience who don't really know what a, a triskel, triskeli is, it's a series of three spirals that are like flowing with one another. It's a triple spiral. Pop culture wise, the, perhaps the most identifiable of this is the airbender sign in Avatar The Last Airbender is a triskelion. It is a Triskel. So cheeky on their part, because they're going back to this really, really unique history of a, a symbol that I find very compelling for Sicily, because it's it could be considered to be an interlocking series of Archimedean spirals, or to represent three bent human legs, which is what we see in the Sicilian flag, as well as the flag of the Isle of Man, mm -hmm. which is also medieval. And then the, the Gorgon head, the Medusa head. I just, I love that, because that Greek that then becomes Roman, that then becomes Sicilian. Like, just that presence of that history. I also just love Gorgons. I love <laughs> the lore, and I love that, like, Medusa herself has, you know, in the past decade or so, become an icon of, like, female strength and yeah. autonomy and the patriarchy just being the fucking worst. <laughs> <laughs> And misunderstanding women <laughs> um, but I mean do you have any thoughts on this flag Elo or um well it's quite interesting because I feel like if you go to any kind of Sicilian restaurant in Europe or abroad mm -hmm. you'll find that like that's probably one of the first symbols that they use um they also kind of use the moon or the sun the Sicilian sun is kind of like is, is used in ceramics they have different kind of like meanings and connotations it yeah, is the is the moon a crescent moon or a full moon? Crescent. Because like Turkey and everything, their moon's a crescent. So I wonder if that's yeah. related. Random digression fun fact on the crescent moon really quick. We're talking about like medieval. Did you know that croissants are not actually French? They're originally from like Turkey in the Middle mm. East. And croissant, that word is a over time development of the word in, I believe, like Turkish of crescent because of their shape. You know, I'm not even surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Connecting it's one the of those dots. things where it's like, yeah, it's one of those things where like, mm, yeah, actually I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me that it's a, it's a thing. So sorry, continue. I just... No, no. I mean, it's, I know that, for example, owls are meant to be good luck charms. Sun is meant to be like joy, I think. 
And then, you know, the symbol of Sicily, you'll have people who got it tattooed. I saw that today and I was like, oh, yeah. So, I mean, it is still kind of pervasive and still a symbol. So it's interesting to see that, like, there are things that we in England or in America that used to be symbols once upon a time and now have lost their meaning whereas here that still remains an active symbol an active signifier of Sicily. Yeah especially because so just thinking very broadly of the moon of the sun and actually of the triscal of these spirals is that you find them and what they signify around the world in disconnected cultures to allude to the same thing so the sun as warmth as joy as a life force the moon yeah. as, you know, the sister or the nighttime sun. And then the Triscoll. So even though it's so bound to, I guess you could say the Mediterranean area because of the Greek Archimedean and then Sicily is actually also found in early Celtic traditions in Ireland. Yeah, and that's been cool. Appears there. And I actually have like a Triscalian necklace that I bought in Sligo, Ireland that I wear every day because there the triscal is meant to be like the harmony of the elements and the seasons and then when christian missionaries came to try to convert you know from the pagan quote unquote uh celts it became a symbol of the holy trinity but yeah. found still in pagan iconography so that kind of give and take so that was how i first was introduced to triscals personally which yeah. is just really interesting because they're so geographically far apart and yet they no, have true. this Something so same similar. instinctual, yeah. Um, yeah. So I just, I love that. I think that that is... Beautiful. I think it's interesting, right? Because like all of these cultures, they seem so far apart and so different. But then when you go down to the core of it, like mm-hmm. especially with different invasions and stuff, you realize that we're all the same. At the core of it, like we all inherently experience and see the world the same. Like you look at the cave paintings in Lascaux or somewhere else and it's like they're yeah. using images and depictions there that we still identify with today yeah. like signing off a painting in the case of Lascaux with a handprint to like signify I was human I was here you know this is me and I mean even Jackson Paul like put a handprint in one of his paintings yeah to like be like this is my mark and then, of course, you know, your identification as a human now with science and everything is your fingerprint, which is on your yeah. hand. So it's sorry really interesting. Digression, I just feel like this is such a, the fact that we got here from talking about, you know, a chapel in Sicily, but then yeah. looking and thinking about it and how it just, it returns to, we are all human and we all cohabit this earth. And I just think that we should respect one another and yeah. appreciate one another. I agree. <laughs> I think this is like a perfect conclusion, you know? <laughs> I agree. Like, oh, the end of the book. I feel like we've just done like, a, like a, a nighttime story, but full of history and facts and deviations. Hello, why don't you give us some of our social media? So you can find us um, on Spotify and on Apple Podcast by just typing Modern Medieval Podcast. Um, And then you can find us on Instagram by typing podcast.modern.medieval. You can find us on Twitter. Yeah, on Twitter. Our handle is medieval underscore modern. A little flip there for you. And you can also find us on Facebook. We have a public group that is hosted by our public page where we try to post fun little facts and things. Drop us a message. We like it when people say hi or even have yeah. corrections because we got something wrong. We're still learning. Please educate yeah. us. And then, of <laughs> course, you know, email if you want to yeah. be a little bit more uh, private incognito. And that is modern.medieval.podcast at gmail.com. We will respond. So give us your love. Yeah, for listening to us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Share, like, comment. Last us to all your friends, even if they don't like the medieval, because yeah. we're fun and we have pop culture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ello, so much for sharing a bit of your your homeland in Sicily. I learned a lot. Thank you. It was and very fun. I had a great time. So <laughs> until next time, I'm Megan. And I'm Ello, and this is Modern Medieval, the podcast. Woo. <laughs>